John gives us an account of Jesus' actions with a specific focus on how what Jesus did in the temple pointed forward to his death and resurrection. So we're going to look at those verses. It's John 2, 13 to 25 uh, and try to break them down. So the gospel for this week says this. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons, and the money changers at their business. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all with the sheep and oxen out of the temple. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, Take these things away, for you shall not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for thy house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign do you have to show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he spoke of the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. But Jesus did not trust himself to them, because he knew all men, and he needed no one to bear witness of man, for he himself knew what was in man. All right, we'll stop there. A lot going on here in this uh, account. So let's walk through it and hit some key points. First, notice when it takes place. Twice John emphasizes for you that this takes place at the time of the Jewish Passover. So if you go back to the Old Testament, Leviticus chapter 23, Exodus chapter 12, the Passover was the feast that not only celebrated the exodus from Egypt and the deliverance from Pharaoh, but it was also celebrated each year in the spring, somewhere around March or April. Um, so if you think about this, when John says it was Passover time, he's telling you it was springtime. So there's already a connection for you between the passage and our own remembrance of this text during Lent, right? So we too are in a sense preparing for the great Passover of Easter. That's the first connection there, a liturgical connection. The second element of the account we want to emphasize here is the reason Jesus turns the tables of the money changers over and he drives them out with a whip, right? I mean, this is... This is serious here. Um, why would Jesus do that? What's the rationale here? Well, although many people kind of assume or even assert that the money changers are cheating people and that that's the primary reason that Jesus is upset with them, you'll notice that the Gospel of John doesn't actually say that. Uh, and there's a reason for that. First, as far as we know, the money changers in the temple were there to perform a legitimate service which would be to take the coinage of people who were coming from all over the world and change it out for the Jerusalem coinage so that people could buy sacrifices. Oxen, sheep, uh, turtle doves, these were the kinds of animals that could be offered in sacrifice in the temple. So the money changers are actually performing an important service to help the pilgrims who would come for Passover. The first century Jewish historian Josephus actually tells us that Passover is such a great uh, festival of pilgrimage for the Jewish people that up to a million Jews would converge on the city of Jerusalem. And so many of them were coming from far away. They couldn't bring their animals with them in order to sacrifice them. It would be too difficult, or the animal might be injured on the way. So what they would do is they would buy clean animals for sacrifice when they got to the city. So the money changers are performing that important service for the Jewish pilgrims so that they can buy sacrifices and have them offered in the temple. Um, so the problem is not really the presence of the money changers uh, in Jerusalem, nor is it clear that they're cheating anyone. But the real issue seems to be where they're doing the selling. That is, they're doing it in the temple complex itself. And that's why Jesus says, stop making my father's house a house of trade. So what most scholars think here is that the Jewish money changers have set up their tables in what was called the outer court of Herod's temple. When Herod had expanded the temple, King Herod, he made an outer court for the Gentiles so that pagans could come and also worship the God of Israel in the, in the outer court, uh, which they did. 
uh, because there were many pagans called God-fearers who believed that the Jews' God was the true God and who would come to the temple to worship him, to venerate him, and what, what, what not. And so what happens here is that these money changers are effectively robbing the Gentiles of the ability to come and pray in the house of the Father. And so Jesus drives them out and says, stop making my father's house a house of trade. Because you can't pray in a marketplace. I mean, you can't pray whenever you're surrounded by oxen and sheep and goats bleeding and the, just the, the noise and the busyness and the bustle of, of a marketplace. So Jesus here wants to purify and cleanse that sacred space that was set apart, that was holy. All right? In Hebrew, the word holy, kadosh, means set apart. This place was set apart for prayer for the nations, um, and they are turning it into a market instead. So that's, I think, the real reason for the action of Jesus. And you can see the disciples kind of pick up on that when it says their disciples remembered the psalm, Psalm 69, which says, zeal for your house has consumed me. In other words, Jesus loves the temple so much, he can't bear to see its holiness desecrated by turning it into just one more market. So, when he does this, something important happened here. It says that the Jews came to him and said, well, what sign do you have to give us for doing this? Now, I want you to pause here for just a second. Notice the language of the Jews. Uh, one of the interesting things about John's Gospel is that you'll frequently see this language of the Jews. And you need to be careful that we don't read this anachronistically. In other words, when we talk about the Jews, we mean a particular religious group, right? who celebrates certain laws and festivals, who accepts the Hebrew Bible as their scriptures, and so on and so forth. Um, so we mean it as a religious identity. But at the time of Jesus, this is the first century AD, you got to keep it in context here. Remember, Jesus himself is a Jew, right? The apostles are Jews. So the word here for the Jews, a number of scholars have pointed out, is literally eudaioi in Greek. It means the Judeans. It means the people of the South the people especially of Jerusalem, as opposed to the Galileans, which Jesus and his disciples would have been referred to as Galileans. So both Galileans and Judeans are Jews. They all celebrate the same festivals. They all keep the same religious beliefs. Uh, they belong to the same religion, as we would say. But they're from the north and the south. And there are tensions throughout John's gospel between Galileans and Judeans, or between the disciples of Jesus and the Jews. So just keep that in mind here. So what happens here is the Judeans, which is a probably reference to the residents of Jerusalem, especially the chief priests, and the Sadducees, that kind of people who are in charge of the temple, come to Jesus and say, um, excuse me, what, what's your justification for doing this? What sign do you give us? And Jesus says a riddle. He says, destroy this house, and in three days I'll raise it up. Now, they take him literally to be referring to the house of the temple, which was believed to be the house of God. And they say, well, hold on, it's taken 46 years to build this temple, and you're going to raise it up in three days? Now, notice something interesting about that. When they say 46 years, that's a specific reference to the building activities of King Herod the Great, who was king when Jesus was born, who massacred the infants in Bethlehem, and who killed his wife and several of his children. I mean, he was a wicked, evil king. Um, although the temple had actually been rebuilt, in the 5th century BC, it was called the Second Temple, Herod, when he became king, expanded it and beautified it and made it one of the wonders of the ancient world, precisely because he wanted people to think that he was the Messiah, that he was the legitimate king. Because the Jews had prophecies that said when the Messiah would come, he would build a temple that was greater than Solomon's temple even had been, right? And the Second Temple that had originally been built after the exile by Ezra and Nehemiah, was widely recognized as being um, a lesser temple when compared to Solomon's. It wasn't as glorious as Solomon's. So the prophets arose saying one day there would be a great temple, a glorious temple. And Herod tried to kind of bring that prophecy to fulfillment by expanding the temple at the time of Jesus' birth. And it continued to be under construction all the way after his death up to the time of Jesus himself. So when the, the Jews here say, 46 years, they're referring to Herod's temple, right? Now, Jesus takes that opportunity to say, what? Well, destroy this temple, and in three days I'm going to raise it up. So he's getting them to shift their focus from Herod's temple to the actual temple 
that the prophets have spoken of, namely the temple of his body. What does that mean, the temple of his body? Well, it's real simple. From a first century Jewish perspective, the temple was nothing less than the dwelling place of God on earth. So when Jesus identifies himself as the true temple, what he's revealing is that he is the dwelling place of God on earth, that his own body is where God has come to dwell with us, to be with us, right? As John says elsewhere in chapter 1, verse 14, the word became flesh and tabernacled among us, literally. He pitched his tent among us. So it's a revelation, once again, of Jesus' divinity, that also points forward to his resurrection. Because they are going to destroy the temple of his body. But on the third day, he's going to rebuild it by being uh, raised from the dead uh, in the resurrection. So this is a really powerful, powerful sign that points forward to the passion, death, and resurrection of Christ.